in the YouTube is live yet, Handika? Or should it be already? Hold on. In the YouTube is live yet? Okay. Handika? Now it is because I heard my own voice. <laughs> Sorry, Baba. So yeah, welcome again, everyone. So uh, this YouTube, capa uh, the, the Zoom capacity is only 500 and we almost reached the, the limit of that. So I guess uh, we can continue on. Um, so good afternoon for everyone again. Uh, and um, Bapak Ibu can also write down your name, where your organization coming from, and then also which city you are from in the chat feature there. And then also later during the question and answer, you can write down your question on the future Q&A here. So the chat is for the introduction and then say hi to the other and then, you know, chat about other things. And then the question and answer or Q&A feature is for you to ask questions. Yeah, so uh, please don't mix it both. And then for the question and answer later, um, please read um, all of the questions written before you. Uh, if you have any similar question written down there already, you just need to put a thumbs up or upload it so you don't have to rewrite it again because usually we have like a lot of questions from that. So yeah, uh, welcome again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, moderators, uh, and then, you know, distinguished guests, all of you, welcome to the Catch DCC webinar uh, about wildlife trade, zoonotic disease, and the pandemic. Um, I'm Leah Zakia, the program coordinator of Kites DCC. Kites DCC is a collaborative Australia-Indonesia programs on sustainable development and climate change. It is a collaboration between Griffith University, Australia, and Universitas Indonesia, along with some other universities in Indonesia, such as Universitas Hasanuddin in Makassar. The collaboration has several components. The first component is a research collaboration on climate change and sustainable development. We focus on the four themes, uh, impacts of climate change on planetary and human health, sustainable landscape management, energy transition and carbon pricing, and increasing the resilience of small islands in Eastern Indonesia. This research collaboration component aims at enhancing the science to policy principle. Therefore, we have included various stakeholders as well to the research, national and local government, private sectors, NGOs, and communities. The second component is the capacity building. The third is student mobility between Australia and Indonesia, especially between all these uh, universities that are in our network. And the fourth one is the high level dialogues and a series of webin webinar. So this event is under this component. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. Oh, actually you could have a participant more than 500. I just realized that I thought our capacity is 500. <laughs> Sorry about that, I'm happy. So welcome for those of you who are just joining. Um, so yeah, without further ado, because we only have maximum two hours for this, um, and I'll just uh, continue on for uh, giving the floor to Prof. Yatna Supriyatna, the Director of Sustainable Earth and Resources, or ICER, from Universitas Indonesia. He is a renowned scientist globally, and he got many species named after him. So it's pretty cool. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome me to uh, please join me to welcome Prof. Yatna Supriyatna. You can clap your hands if you want because why not? <laughs> Bye, Yatna. Okay, thank you, Leah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the participant of webinar, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And let me first uh, thanking to all speaker here. Professor Hamis McCallum, uh, Dr. Nokiar Andayani, uh, also Dr. Esther Onya, Onyanga. I hope it's correct. <laughs> and also the moderator, uh, Maggie Moormans, and also Leah. And I also thanking for, I hope, Prof. Kathleen here, and also Prof. Rahmat Mitular. Uh, is uh, at the CAIP disease uh, management. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to uh, just thanking for everybody 
and see what that really the KFDCC is uh, during the pandemic. We have a, a webinar from the start, of course, with the global health, uh, planetary health. We have uh, discussed this with uh, the head of the Jakarta's uh, health and also with many others uh, from uh, Griffith University, we were di discussing about this uh, possible, uh, how that pandemic can be really, really uh, bad or good in Indonesia. And the second series was really uh, this uh, month uh, on the sustainable uh, landscape and especially we are having uh, a very good uh, uh, professor, Professor Brendan from Griffith University and myself. And we are discussing about this the impact, you know, the possible impact of this landscape changes. Because Indonesia, of course, every year we have uh, landscape changes because of the conversion of the forest and many others but also the possible of comorbidity, you know. What does it mean, comorbidity? That if the, if the, the haze coming from the landscape, uh, converts in the landscape, the forest fire, so that the impact is going to be double or maybe uh, more uh, to the, the COVID uh, patient. So that that's really, and the other one is also the possible to have one health, uh, you know, one health means that not only health for uh, people, but also health for the environment, for our forests, and many others. So ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, this is really important to the, uh, the to today uh, webinar, especially on wildlife trade a zoonotic disease and the pandemic. So I think that's a follow up of uh, yesterday where we only discussing about the landscape, how the landscape, but now is to the core of the core, which is about the zoonotic itself and how that really the, the also maybe the origin of the, of the pandemic itself and how that really happened. So uh, uh, for, Everybody, uh, participant in webinar, uh, uh, let me say good luck to hear this very important from very prominent person. Thank you. So uh, have a webinar. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Yatna. So yeah, um, I'll just need to uh, address some people that are attending here. Thank you very much for coming. Ada Pak Wahyudi Wardoyo as well, Ibu Nurul uh, from various uh, NGOs, various universities in Indonesia and Australia as well. Ada dari Papua, uh, from everywhere. So thank you very much for your interest in joining our webinar. I hope it's useful. Um, and then again, uh, I need to um, uh, remind you as well so that we can have this uh, smoothly. Uh, later, you can write down your question in the Q&A section. And then before you write down your question, please check first whether you, there is any similar question to yours. And then you can just upvote it so that we don't have like multiple uh, same or similar questions in the Q&A box. And then if you want to uh, send message through chat, make sure that um, and then want the other attendees to know that, make sure that you set the um, format or the settings into the panelists and the attendees who can see it, yeah? Uh, so thank you very much for that. And then next, uh, we will uh, start this discussion, but I need to introduce our um, wonderful chair today, uh, which is um, Maggie Mormons. Uh, she was born in Indonesia and uh, raised in the Netherlands. And Maggie has over 19 years experience in community engagement and community-based conservation in Europe, Latin America, Asia, and Oceania. Her projects include the establishment of community conservation areas, protected area management, and alternative livelihood, 
development. Maggie is currently a PhD candidate at Griffith University, researching community engagement in conservation. And then she is one of the leading uh, researchers in Types DCC, who will research about community engagement in several locations in Indonesia. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Maggie Moorman. Yay. There's Thank you, no Leah. Thank you. All right, so welcome, Dan Selamat Siang, and thank you for joining us in this webinar, an event hosted by Universitas Indonesia and Griffith University Australia. I'm delighted to have been invited to chair again. Last week was really well attended and we had some wonderful discussions. Uh, the webinar today will cover a different topic and this time with more focus on human health and connection to wildlife. So I'm delighted to introduce three distinguished guests. Um, first of all, we have Professor Hamish McKellen, head of Griffith Wildlife Disease Ecology Group, School of Environment with Griffith University. Now, Hamish is a professor in environmental science at Griffith University in Queensland, Australia, and is leader of the Plan Planetary Health Platform within the university's Environmental Futures Research Institute. Um, he's a disease ecologist with particular interests in wildlife disease and zoonotic disease, and a perfect guest for our panel today. Current major research projects include understanding spillover of the lethal Hendra virus from flying foxes to horses and humans, and understanding the effect of anthropogenic environmental change on emerging zoonotic diseases. In 2011, he was a senior member of a team awarded the Eureka Prize in Environmental Research, and that is Australia's premier award in environmental science for his work on Tasmanian devil facial tumor. And if you're not familiar with a Tasmanian devil, I'm hoping that um, Professor Hamish can share a photo later because they are very cute. Um, our second guest is Dr. Novia Andayani. She has a doctoral degree in biology and more than 30 years of experience in working in biodiversity conservation. Um, she has been leading Wildlife Conservation Society Indonesia program since 2004, uh, providing overall leadership to the implementation of conservation initiatives and actions including the marine program. She's also a senior lecturer in the University um, of Indonesia, which also active in various conservation organizations and foundations as chairman, secretary or member. And it's wonderful to have someone on the panel with many years of experience in on the ground conservation in Indonesia. I've worked in conservation in Indonesia for seven years myself. So hats off for doing it for 30, not an easy task. Um, and last but definitely not least, we are joined by Dr. Esther Onyango, a research fellow at Griffith University. She is part of a transdisciplinary research program on the impacts of climate change and vector-borne diseases. Um, she's challenged by the opportunity to link disciplines under a planetary health research framework with a focus on the Australia and Asia Pacific region to study how environmental change, ecological disruption and human behavior are influencing the spread and distribution of mosquito-borne viruses in Australia and the Pacific region. Really great to have you with us, Esther, to provide that insight from a climate change perspective as well. So welcome everyone. I'm confident that the contributions from a panel will be very valuable and we're very fortunate to have the opportunity today for their council. So these are our three guests, but before we go any further, I would just like to acknowledge where we are coming to you from or where I'm coming to you from. I'm located at my house in Tugan, which is on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia, and it is tradition in Australia to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet. So I would just like to acknowledge the Kumameri people of this region and pay respects to their elders past and present and emerging, as well as the people and lands from the participants that have joined us today. And I briefly noticed that we have people attending from all parts of Indonesia, Australia, and even Thailand. So let us begin with setting the scene and then put some questions to our guests. Um, as mentioned by Leah before, Zoom allows you to write questions to us and by giving an indication of the popularity of these questions, you could like or upvote the questions that may be popular and allows us to feed these questions through to the panel. If you feel more comfortable to write your question in Bahasa Indonesia, please do. Tolong menulis pertanyaan anda di Bahasa Indonesia kalau lebih mudah. Saya bisa baca Bahasa Indonesia tapi berbicara sedikit malu saya. Um, I do want to acknowledge in advance that we have a lot of people registered and a lot of people attending. So we probably don't have time to answer all questions. So that's the introductions and technicalities out of the way. Let me just begin with making a few opening remarks and clearly one of the significant reasons we are meeting like this online as opposed to face to face is because we are affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and its associated implications and in particular how it may have affected our relationship 
uh, with the environment. What this crisis has revealed is that even without a looming pandemic, the majority of emerging infectious disease events are caused by zoonotic pathogens. And due to an increase in life expectancy, it has also come with the degradation of a large scale of nature's ecological system. So what we are faced with at the moment is a widespread concern of the connection between zoonotic diseases and the pressure on our environment and how they are connected. Do these pressures include uh, wildlife trade? What is the trend in Indonesia in regard to this? Things that we'll have to confront now would be how disease can be transmitted from wild animals to human contact and how can it then lead to an epidemic or pandemic and not stay in isolated events? Can we prevent the spread of zoonotic diseases in the future by, for example, tackling wildlife trade? So what I would like to do is give the floor to each of our speakers to shed some light on this and we'll then open up for some discussion and questions. Um, I will urge the panel to only take five to seven minutes for providing your initial thoughts. I would preferably like to get questions flowing and as many relevant ones answered. Um, so Professor Hamish McCallum, would you like to go first in presenting some of your thoughts and especially how we need to plan our conservation efforts during our pandemic? In your work, bats and horses haven't really been in a positive light amongst the community and with this situation, it, we again have bats on people's minds. How can we then still push for their conservation as an essential ecological link when they keep having such a bad rap? Pangolins have been recently removed from the additional medicine list in China. Would that be one of the strategies you think? Please, um, Professor McCallum. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'll, and in response to your direct question, then I think we need to be um, very certainly very careful about uh, making sure that we don't allow the panic about um, about bats to um, actually have an impact or cause people to um, decide the best thing to do with them is get rid of them because they do supply essential ecosystem services. I'm just checking, can everyone hear me? Because I just got a message suggesting that somebody couldn't. So are you hearing me at the moment? Yes, I can hear you fine. Oh, absolutely perfect. Thank you. I was just a little bit concerned because I just saw something floating by. Um, so what I'd like to do is to just make a few comments about zoonotic spillover in general, and um, then try to talk a little bit about that in the response to the wildlife trade. But I would prefer most of the wildlife trade stuff to come by questions from people rather than me sort of speaking um, too much about it. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen right now. Um, Let me just check. Can you see my screen? I hope you can. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, so before I start, I do want to acknowledge the traditional people from the land on which I'm present. I'm a little bit further south of Maggie. I'm at Byron Bay in northern New South Wales. And um, the traditional owners of this area are the Bundjalung people and particularly the Arakwal um, tribe of the Bundjalung. So um, I'd like to acknowledge their elders past and present and um, recognize that they are the original owners of this land. Okay. Um, I'm hoping I'm gonna get the next slide. Let me see. Um, that's strange, it worked before. Let me get back to here. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble sharing my screen. It worked before, which is very frustrating. Um, hang on. Um, sorry, we tested this and of course I'm having the typical problems that one always has that it worked. Before. Ah, here we go. Okay, thank you very much. I've got my mouse on the right screen now. Um, as Maggie said, the most fundamental thing to understand is that um, disease emergence is increasing. This is a classic paper that everybody cites from, it's over a decade old now. Um, and it's showing that the number of um, emerging disease events has been increasing uh, per decade for about the last 50 or 60 years. And most of those disease emergence events are zoonotic. And all zoonotic means is that it's a pathogen which comes from an animal source. And in fact, most of those animal sources are wildlife sources, which you can see in the white bars here. Um, there appears to be a little bit of a decrease in the last decade, but that's in fact only up to 2000 things have been continuing on from there. So zoonotic um, 
pathogens are the major cause of emerging disease events, and it's increasingly important to try to understand what's causing these. Um, I um, published, along with a bunch of other people, um, a review paper in Nature Reviews Microbiology looking at the pathways to zoonotic spillover. And I just want to talk through this um, in general and then a little bit with respect to, um, to the wildlife trade. The, the first point, sorry, someone's raised their hand. Eight participants, are people not seeing it? Uh, no, it's okay, you can go on. Okay, perfect, excellent. Um, so there are three fundamental routes by which um, pathogens can get from wildlife to humans. Um, the first is if the, um, the pathogen is excreted directly from the wildlife, and this could be either in feces or urine, or in fact, it could even in some cases um, be via aerosols. So the pathogen is shed directly from the reservoir host, which is the wildlife host upon which it lives. It then has to survive in the environment. Humans have to be exposed to it, and there's a lot of aspects of human behavior which relate to that. That then produces a route of exposure and an infective dose. And then there's a bunch of processes that are occurring within the human host, which determines whether or not the human host, in fact, develops an infection. And I'll be talking about those in a little bit more detail later. The second route, which is perhaps as important or maybe more important in this particular context, is you can also get exposure via slaughter. So um, the pathogen may be in the tissues of the host or released in the blood. Um, it can be transported around with meat, possibly from the point of slaughter. And then the route of exposure in that particular case can be via ingestion or direct exposure to the blood or to um, other bodily fluids which happen when that's butchered. Again, that produces an infective dose. And again, then there are also the barriers inside the human. The third route is the vector-borne one, um, about which I don't want to say very much because it's probably not particularly relevant when one is dealing with the wildlife trade, although not entirely irrelevant. Um, the second general insight that we gained from this, um, this review is that there's a bunch of barriers between the pathogen getting from the wildlife host through to humans. And each of these barriers has gaps, which we've sort of represented here like holes in the Swiss cheese. And these gaps can be narrow in some cases, they can be broad in others, they can move in space and time, and you only get a spillover event when all of those gaps align. So um, initially, obviously, you've got to have the reservoir host distribution um, overlapping potentially with the human host distribution. Um, the reservoir hosts have got to be in sufficient density in order for the pathogen to uh, be prevalent at a high level. So that drives passion, pathogen prevalence and also um, infection intensity. Then the pathogen needs to be somehow released from the reservoir host. And there's a bunch of drivers which can cause that to happen. It needs to survive in the environment. And then the humans need to be exposed. And then there's a bunch of within host barriers such as the immune system and so forth. And that all determines whether or not spillover can occur. So that's the very general pattern which applies to any spillover event. If one looks at this with respect to the wildlife trade, then clearly um, if one brings wildlife into the a market situation, then you're altering the reservoir host distribution. You're also typically very substantially increasing that distribution above what it would normally be. And that will therefore tend to drive high pathogen prevalence and high infection intensity. The other thing that tends to happen in a market situation or even a farming situation is the animals are likely to be more stressed than they would typically be in the wild. And one of the things that we certainly know very clearly with the Hendra virus case is that as hosts get stressed for whatever reason, they tend to shed virus. So um, frequently one has virus infecting hosts, but not very much gets released. But if you actually stress them, then you get large amounts of, um, 
of pathogen release. And um, then, of course, before it can infect humans, it's got to survive in the environment. And again, the sort of environment that one finds when you have slaughter occurring in a wet market is a situation which is conducive to both the, para the pathogen surviving and also potentially spreading on a local scale. And then, of course, you've got humans being exposed. Uh, the, Rohan, you have one more uh, minute left. Oh, sure. Okay, I'll be very, very quick. Um, the last point I want to make is that frequently this process will infect an intermediate host and then you run through the process again to get onto a human host. Um, I've got one more minute, so I'll be very, very quick. That gets us to, to the level of it spilling over. But once it's spilled over, there's a bunch of different stages that can happen. You can get things that spill over but don't go any further. You can get ones that spill over and have sort of stuttering chains of transmission. So they get around a little bit amongst humans, but they don't go pandemic. And then you can one, get ones that once it gets across into the human population, it becomes pandemic. That's driven by something called R0, which I don't have a lot of time to go through. Um, so I won't bother talking my way through this. I think everybody's probably, this has been all over the media. Um, but I do want to make the point that R0 is determined by infection rate per unit time and time infection persists. And it's a function of the host, the pathogen, and the environment. It's not a category, a, a property of the pathogen itself. I just want to finish on one very final point. This is something which has only just come out. This is in a so-called preprint survey. Um, so it may or may not be, uh, it hasn't been refereed yet, but it's a paper that's just come out and it's showing that coronavirus, um, not the particular coronavirus we're talking about here, but coronaviruses in general are very, very common in both rodents and bats. And as things move through the supply chain, so going from the trader to the large market to the restaurant, there's very good evidence that the prevalence of the coronavirus increases. So there's, there are things in the supply chain that are driving increased levels of infection of viruses. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. So given I was only asked to give a very short talk, I will finish it there. And I will stop sharing my screen if I can work out how to do that. Here we go. All right, thank you for introducing us to the concept of spillover, um, Professor McCallum. I'm sure we will learn more about the infection rates throughout the session and the presence of coronavirus um, in the supply chain as well. We have some questions already, but I'll get to those after um, uh, the rest of our panel have spoken as well. So I'd like to um, now give the floor to uh, Dr. Novia. Um, please share your insights from the Indonesian perspective, Doctor. Yes. Thank you, Chairs. And I think I will need um, the committee to share the screen. Yes, that's right. This is my presentations. Thank you. Um, can we get into the, yes, great. Thank you, um, Chair. No, the first one first. Thank you, Chair. And then thank you, uh, CAPES DCC, for uh, inviting me. It's an honor to be speaking alongside Professor McCallum and Dr. Niago on the subject that has been a global important for the past six months. Next slide, please. Um, as it happens, I also start my talk with Jones et al. publications. Uh, this slide presents a summary of emerging uh, infectious diseases uh, for six decades. As uh, you know, um, as as you can see from here, the, that 72 percent of the zoonotic diseases that have emerged since the 1940s have come from wildlife, including Ebola, HIV, and SARS. And uh, the problem here that we see, the frequencies, uh, those uh, these novel uh, diseases are emerging is um, increasing um, over time. Uh, many studies have reported the links between zoonotic outbreaks and land use changes. If we can look at the map at the bottom, uh, special distributions um, of hotspot for EID share three characteristics in common. Uh, that is uh, high human population density, high biodiversity, and rapid environmental uh, uh, changes. Those changes bring closer uh, human and wildlife, mostly in negative interactions, such as human wildlife conflicts, uh, poaching, and wildlife trade. 
while well, trade lies at the centers of previous and current pandemics and any strategies to prevent uh, super future pandemics must therefore address this issue and uh, underlying factors including forest uh, degradations next slide please once forest is cleared to give away to our economic and social developments we create a high risk human wildlife interface Forest clearance and fragmentations increase the potentials of human wildlife conflicts, providing easy access for poacher to hunt wildlife and therefore becoming a source for wildlife trade. For example, uh, our study shows that the higher incidence of human tiger conflicts across the lesser uh, landscapes could be explained by closer proximity to villages and the depletions of tiger prey. Um, although the people in those villages don't necessarily hunt for the tigers, they definitely kill uh, their prey and therefore adding another pressure to this critically endangered uh, species. We recorded at least uh, four cases of tiger and elephant trafficking that link to human wildlife conflict in this landscape to highlight the fact that wildlife conflict is an important entry point to wildlife uh, trade. Next slide, please. As uh, one of the world's mega diverse countries, Indonesia is an important source for wildlife trade. For the past 17 years, we recorded at least 319 cases, uh, process cases of wildlife trafficking involving more than 200 species, the majority of which are protected under national law and all listed under the IUCN Red List. The total monetary value of fines enforced in these cases are more than 400,000 US dollar, but this is minor actually in comparison to the total value of the traded wildlife that could reach up to 2 million US dollar. This is one of the very reasons why wildlife trade is rampant and difficult to resolve. Next slide, please. The importance of Indonesia as the source and a market country for wildlife trade is presented in this slide. Whether those wildlife end up in ex uh, private collections or in markets, they serve as a powerful carriers that increase the likelihood of zoonotic uh, transmissions. Next slide, please. Besides playing a prominent role in international wildlife trade, Indonesia has major domestic trade for bushmeat. Although it represents an important protein source for many rural and indigenous communities, the presence of wildlife markets and consumptive behaviors at the urban level pose a risk of disease. Among them are those markets located in North Sulawesi, where 36 species have been having been recorded and the quantity of wildlife traded has multiplied by several folds over the past 20 years. With up 800 tons of wildlife animals sold annually, these levels of unregulated trade and consumption, along with pure hygiene, could elevate the risk uh, to human health. Next slide, please. To satiate the demand for bushmeat in North Sulawesi, hunting activities have expanded to other provinces and now occur throughout the island. Recent estimates suggested that up to 1 million individuals of flying foxes are harvested annually only for those markets. The threat of flying foxes requires special attention as they are the natural reservoir of viruses and there is a record of disease spill over three animals and then human in other places. The disturbance of flying fox colonies and their killings throughout Sulawesi could elevate the risk to human health, not only in the North Sulawesi where the markets are, but also now to the entire uh, island. Next slide, please. Despite all this, um, we still, again, one more. Yes, despite all this, um, we still find many gaps in the existing policies for example, penalties for crime against illegal wildlife trade are still insufficient compared to the real value of the wildlife itself. Quotas and issuing permits still meet with challenges and precautionary approach uh, that uh, compose the, uh, the core strategy under the law, the Minister Decree number 447-2003 uh, still requires uh, strengthening. 
Meanwhile, uh, we also have reviewed around 100 publications published from 1973 to 2017 and found 34 zoonotic diseases or serological evidences in Indonesia related to various uh, illness, um, including SONY influenza and even a severe acute respiratory syndrome related to a coronavirus uh, strains. Huge proportions of this was related to bats and macaques, including uh, several threatened species such as large flying fox, mm -hmm. Sulawesi flying fox, um, Sulawesi two Sulawesi macaques, uh, macaca hekai, and uh, macaca tongkian or Gorontalo macaques. Um, Low awareness is one of the reasons for this risk, but um, I think people need to understand that maybe while the likelihood of transmission is probably low, the consequences are very high. Uh, next slide, please. This will be my last uh, slide. The human and uh, financial costs associated with uh, global pandemics are significantly greater than taking measures to prevent them in the first place. Since wildlife trade contributes to the condition necessary for their emergence, spillover, and amplification in humans, therefore, I believe the best preventive measure we can do is to stop wildlife trade right at its starting point. It in their natural habitats. This is the set of recommendations I believe we must consider with maintaining ecosystem integrity at the top of the list. To end, I'd like to raise this question to the audience. During the pandemic, there is a global call to shut down wildlife markets and China as the biggest wildlife consumer country considered this option. The question is, should Indonesia follow this example? And if so, what our response look like? Thank you for listening and looking forward to lovely discussion after this. All right, thank you for uh, providing some really interesting information on the local wildlife trade pressures and, and wildlife con conflicts, especially for Indonesia being a source for that trade. They're fairly um, depressing figures, I must say, but um, hopefully we can get more into depth of, of that information as well. So, um, yeah, last but not least, we've got um, Dr. Eso Nyong'o. Um, would you like to provide some thoughts on how this topic sits within the planetary health platform? Uh, please, Esther. Uh, yes, thank you, Maggie. Um, and uh, uh, thank you, Professor Hamish and Professor Novia for providing that context, which actually helps me fit in really well uh, with uh, giving that background on how spillover events uh, emerge, but also how forest degradation and human wildlife interactions are leading to uh, disease changes. So uh, what I look at is planetary health, which basically looks how uh, environmental health is linked to human health and how in, 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 in uh, this space, how disease emergence occurs. So for my presentation today, I'm going to focus a bit, a little bit deeper into um, uh, interactions with the environment and mainly uh, the forest degradation and uh, clearance and the uh, human interactions within and how that leads uh, to disease spread, particularly with vector-borne diseases. Um, so I'll just share my screen briefly. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, um, so just moving on uh, swiftly, trying to move that on. So this uh, is an in infographic provided by the UN that just uh, broadly illustrates uh, how pandemics like COVID-19 can come from different pathways. And there are several uh, pathways uh, as Professor Hamish illustrated, but I think most people agree that primarily these diseases are emerging from how our interactions with the environment, uh, particularly human-induced land change, and also agricultural activity, wildlife and hunting trade are key drivers. Um, in my presentation today, I will focus mainly on uh, human-induced activities, but also climate change and seeing how uh, those drive disease emergence, vector-borne diseases. And um, this quote here on the right, I won't read it uh, in entirety, but it comes from um, a New York Times article by this author, who is an author of a book called Spillover, um, Animals, Infections, and the Next Human Pandemic. And I think this quote uh, really illustrates that the central driver of diseases uh, in the 21st century is humans and um, our, how we are disrupting the environment. 
and our activities on the environment. And this provides a good context for my uh, talk today, which is going to be looking at that. Uh, these pictures just show an aerial view of uh, one of the world's biggest tropical rainforests, which is the Amazon. So the Amazon is approximately 10 million years old and rich with biodiversity. And these four panels just illustrate the different uh, land use activities that have been happening in the forest. You can see clear uh, forest uh, pieces of forest for that have been logged either for settlement or agriculture. And over here you see urbanization and encroaching into the forest and within the forest edges. There's a mining activity uh, going on here and also road networks uh, within uh, the forest. So basically all of these actions, um, uh, but not limited to this, uh, the variety of hazards create a, a, a cascade of factors that facilitate the emergence and spread of diseases. So just briefly in the last, um, uh, in 2019, deforestation in the Amazon increased by 85%. And what this has led to is uh, something known as forest fragmentation, uh, which then um, what, what happens is if you think of the forest as a uh, continuous uh, ecosystem, and then you get little patches of it uh, that come uh, when, when you start uh, doing these activities. So you have it in little patches. And um, uh, uh, what you have is then redistribution of species. Uh, you have some species uh, disappearing, the habitats disappear. You have humans coming closer to uh, uh, species habitats as well and putting themselves at risk of exposure. exposure. You have loss of biodiversity. And so what you create is a um, uh, 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 system where you, uh, increase your chances of virus spillover. Um, so a sort of ecological disequilibrium. I think Professor Hamish mentioned how some of those different factors can align and then you have a spillover and disease emergence. So some examples of uh, spillover events, of course, you know, we're now talking about the COVID-19, but SARS, MERS, HIV, AIDS, Ebola, yellow fever, and Zika. And um, uh, primarily these came from the forest cycle. And these last two are transmitted by vectors, which are mosquitoes, which is um, my focus of my talk today. So if, basically, if we think about um, uh, trying to move that, sorry, just have a bit of, okay. So vector-borne uh, zoonosis basically are, uh, uh, diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans, either through contact with uh, uh, arthropods that are uh, vectors, that are called vectors. And this can be any of these down here, but the, the biggest vectors at the moment are mosquitoes. And um, this table just really illustrates some of the common vector-borne zoonoses. And as you can see, mosquitoes uh, present a big variety of that, and particularly mosquito-borne viruses. And the other thing you'll notice is when you come to the mosquito borne viruses, the Aedes mosquito in particular is responsible for quite a few uh, vector borne diseases. Um, we've heard that about 72% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonosis, but out of this 593 are known mammalian viruses and 29% are vector borne. And there is the hypothesis that this may be increasing in the future because when you come to vector borne diseases, they, they have three times the host range uh, compared to non vector borne diseases. So you can see hosts can either be humans or other animals or even you know, small mammals as well or uh, insects. So they can, uh, these viruses can populate a variety of hosts. Um, so increasing their chances of transmission. An example of a vector-borne disease uh, a, of interest at the moment is yellow fever that um, has a forest cycle as well as a human cycle. Actually, it does have three cycles. There is the, the forest or sylvatic cycle, there's an intermediate or savanna cycle, and there is an urban cycle. It's primarily transmitted by the Aedes mosquito. It is preventable through vaccination. There is a vaccine for it, but it is increasingly becoming challenging to prevent uh, because there have been recent epidemics that have occurred. So there is a need to, to re-strategize how we approach this disease. And it's largely driven by 
human interactions with our landscapes, you know, forest encroachment and uh, clearing. And uh, part of the reason why it's becoming more difficult to control is because of the, those three cycles where it can circulate. Um, so finding, you know, the strategies that can control for all three at the same time becomes challenging. Another example of a vector borne disease, which is more recent, a zoonotic disease, is a Zika, which emerged in uh, 2015, but initially came out of the forest cycles for monkeys in 1947 in Africa and traveled across the, the uh, going eastward with uh, small outbreaks here and another outbreak here and the big one that happened in Brazil. So one thing you notice is uh, as Zika traveled, it also presented with more and more complications. The initial outbreak was just one or two people to 5,000 and to 30,000 neurological complications. And then you had the big outbreak in um, 2015, which I think was about 62,000. But that's when you saw more neurological complications in microcephaly. So what we know at the moment, uh, particularly, this is also transmitted by the Aedes mosquito. The Aedes mosquito is, uh, and enjoys a wide global distribution. And particularly you can see here in Australia, in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and it's responsible for transmitting uh, a number of viruses. And um, some of them we still don't understand the implications for humans. And uh, we also know that under changing climate, um, nearly 1 billion people will be at risk of transmission from this mosquito. It's a very invasive mosquito. It, um, it uh, enjoys a variety, a wide range of suitable thermal temperatures. And so we don't understand the potential threat of yet unidentified zoonotic pathogens that might be borne by these mosquitoes and the risks to human health. And also there still needs to be more consideration of the human wildlife link on how this uh, Aedes also can transmit zoonotic pathogens because as I just illustrated that example with, um, with uh, Zika and also yellow fever, they, they have in the past evolved from animals, you know, wild animals and jumped into humans. So understanding those key factors then becomes critical as well. So I'll just um, end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Esther, for your um, yeah for your presentation, um, especially on the vector-borne disease eradication, and and maybe also we, yeah it, it sort of leads into thinking about you know do we have all the resources available to protect ourselves, and maybe not just you know in um, in Indonesia but also in other countries, and 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 are we able to have access to those resources as well? Um, in my experience, it's not always recognised as a disease. Working in remote parts of Sumatra, you know things like um, Dengue fever was called uh, just angin or the ghost. Um, and then maybe climate temperatures warming, we may have even be more at risk in areas that are now warming up as well. So something to, um, to think about. So thanks for that. And that closes off um, sort of those introductory uh, remarks from our, our speakers. And we've had quite a few questions coming in already, um, but I'd just um, like to ask that the first lead up question um, for uh, Professor Hamish about the sort of, you mentioned that certain human behaviors lead to uh, contact with the pathog pathogens. Um, are you able to expand a little bit more on those behaviors? Is that more in regards to sort of that deforestation as well or, or are there any other behaviors that you, that you would think um, would cause that? Um, well, there's a very wide range of human behaviours which can increase exposure to pathogens. So, um, you know, yes, habitat destruction is one, obviously. Um, one of the things that, of course, happens is any, any process that increases the contact with humans and wildlife, which humans have not previously been exposed to to any great extent, is likely to lead to increased rates of spillover. So, that will include um, the sort of thing that happens from um, destroying forests, but also, of course, human behaviours um, such as uh, bringing the animals um, into markets or ranching them. Um, so, yeah, there's a very, very broad range of human behaviours uh, which can increase exposure to these pathogens. And there are things that one can do to try to minimise those rates of contact or manage them. 
Okay, thank you. So in order to minimise those, uh, those behaviours, you know, we're obviously looking a little bit more at sort of behavioural change and trying to change those behaviours. And um, I think um, Professor, uh, Dr Novia already talked about sort of gaps in, you know, that, that the, the policy in, in regards to that. So maybe this is a question for the, all, of, all of you in, in the panel. Um, in, in regards to the role of, let's say, not-for-profit organisations and, and in, when they're in collaboration with the governmental organisations to tackle wildlife trade right at the source, because uh, Dr Novia mentioned about, you know, that it's a problem at the source, we've got to tackle it at the source. Um, do you think they are able to cl close that policy gap um, that, that was mentioned somehow, or what would their role be in sort of curbing that um, that wildlife trade issue that we have? Um, I, I think one needs to be a little careful about suggesting that the solution is to completely ban all wildlife trade um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, one is that if you ban something and you drive it underground, then you may lose the ability to manage it or regulate it. And um, I think, um, you know, speaking as a, um, as a white person in a first world country, I think one needs to not be told of sort of neo-colonialist about this, that um, eating wild meat has been part of cultures for a very large, for a very large number of years. And in fact, of course, we do it as well. Um, the hunting culture is enormously uh, widespread in um, North America in particular, but also in Europe and to some extent in Australia. So I, I think um, to simply say that the solution is that people must not eat wild meat, and if they do, they're bad people and they should be prosecuted. I think that's naive and um, both culturally unacceptable and probably unenforceable. I think what we need to be doing is trying to um, make sure that these things don't endanger the existence of the wildlife species. And of course, you know, increased human population density makes that difficult. And if such consumption is happening that we make sure that it's not happening in a way that increases the risk of zoonotic disease transmission. Thank you for that. And, and Dr. Andayani, do you share that thought that maybe wildlife trade shouldn't be completely banned, but maybe have certain restrictions um, that allow sort of that safe consumption somehow, or, or whether there is maybe some kind of increase in that public awareness field, um, looking at sort of that, that those the wildlife uh, consumption habits that are embedded in a culture. Um, thank you, um, Maggie. I think um, I share part of uh, Professor uh, McCallum's uh, opinions here. Um, a complete ban for, for um, you know, wildlife consumptions, which are actually legally uh, done in Indonesia, is uh, sounds uh, naive and maybe uh, cannot be, um, how to say, against uh, socially and, and culturally acceptable for those people. But the question here that I'm, I'm pushing uh, within uh, through my presentation is that you know, this is not the practice itself that, that matters, right? But the scale of the practice that, 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 that uh, put us into the situation. You know, if we eat one, um, how to say, one um, um, flying foxes, maybe it is it's okay. But if we end up consuming, you know, a thousand of tons of flying foxes, I don't think it is okay. So, but the, 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 the roles of uh, NGO like, like uh, you know, like WCS here, um, you know, is supporting the, the government to understand, you know, the, 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 of course, the social and ecological context of these wildlife consumptions in order for us to address, uh, you know, and then to develop a much better and much appropriate, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 policies. Um, there's still a long way to go. What, what, what I would like to uh, highlight here, you, you know, uh, in response to this, this kind of uh, questions and then for, uh, I think, a wider discussion about this, um, you know, we, 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 there is a very, very thin lines between, you know, protected and non-protected, endangered and non-endangered species. Once we cross these this lines, you know, everything that non-protected and in the end, I'm afraid that it will be uh, end up as uh, protective. And then those that, that uh, non-endangered, uh, 
you know in the end will be put uh, under the endangered list as as well uh, the, the 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 response need to be divided into uh, into you know a, a strong and then consistent law enforcement for those already being protected under this uh, under, under our uh, national law and under our international uh, commitment but then you know through different modes of you know uh, social uh, um, you know um, just if, um, 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 how to say innovative in, in innovative uh, uh, model to to uh, including uh, convincing the, the 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 community uh, you know uh, to be to be aware and then to be more careful in in, in consuming not only uh, in terms of the hygienic or health related issue but also in terms of the the volumes of the uh, you know their, their their consumptions okay thank you for that and um maybe um esther would you mind just highlighting then if we're pushing for you know controlled sort of wildlife trade or um you know looking at you know in terms of vector borne um diseases how how can we influence or how can we work together at a global perspective so maybe the role of g20 countries um that may have a role in in pushing that type of agenda is is that what what uh, point of view would you have on on that side so more that global collaboration um well it's it, it's hard it's it's a bit, a bit more challenging for me to link that because um wildlife trade is not directly implicated in uh vector -borne diseases but human interactions with wildlife then um provide the potential you know for for some of these uh, vector -borne diseases to uh, transfer to humans, particularly uh, when you have vectors that have that equally bite humans and also animals. And um, so the the way I see it is, if you have um, you know if you're there's increasing stay uh, wildlife trade and there's loss of species diversity, then you potentially have a vector that um, may have a preference for animals will then go ahead and bite humans in instead. Another point is where you would have uh, the disease transferring over. I think at a policy level, it's just being aware again of those links. It becomes um, challenging to integrate all those factors as well, and to just design as a policy that uh, uh, fits in um, fits all really. Yeah, it, it would be hard to, to find a policy. I imagine that fits all, and it, it's everyone has different pressures on their own environment and different resources available as well. So. It would be um, would be a hard hard one to, to find. Um, I've got a question um, probably for um, Dr. Mc, uh, Professor McCallum um, in regards to the research uh, that um, sort of looked at the um, the pangolin uh, sort of inclusion in, in the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. Uh, there's there's been some research efforts showing that uh, COVID nineteen originated from infected pangolins. Is that something you can confirm, or is it really something that we, you know, we can't really blame the one animal and have to look at sort of a range of factors? Um, yeah, I, I think your last statement is probably the correct one. I mean, the the one I'm not. I mean, I, I've been obviously taking a very strong interest in um, the COVID nineteen situation, but um, I wouldn't claim to be an absolute expert on the subject. What is clear is that the virus's closest relatives are um, viruses of bats. So the original source um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the virus was in fact bats, not, uh, not, um, not pangolins. Um, there are some hypotheses that it may have um, gone via pangolins, but there are other potential intermediate hosts as well. Um, so what frequently happens is that if you have two different viruses infecting the same host at the same time, they essentially swap bits with each other. And um, the recombined virus then can have characteristics which are different from the original source virus. And certainly in this particular case, um, the original bat virus has um, additional capabilities that now enable it to infect humans. And whether or not that recombination happened in a pangolin or in something else, my understanding is it's not entirely clear at the moment. Um, frankly, I think there's a little bit of perhaps wishful thinking going on that 
I think many of us in the conservation business um, recognise the enormous issue of the pangolin trade and how this is driving pangolins to extinction. And I think to be able to blame the pangolin trade and therefore say this is a reason to stop it uh, would be something that many people would like to do. But I think it's certainly at this stage, my understanding is the involvement of the pangolin in the transmission is not entirely unambiguous at the moment. Okay, thank you. And then um, that, that, that explains that as well. And, and I guess, you know, the recent sort of news has come out that, you know, China has banned the, or taken the pangolin off the traditional medicine list. So, you know, it is an achievement for the conservation of, of pangolins. But um, the question from Diva um, Alfiaman leads into that, where there are cases of uh, where wildlife trade is used for traditional medicines, especially by, by traditionalists. Um, uh, this is probably a question for um, Dr. Andayani. How do you suggest we eradicate this traditionalist dogma, especially considering how many people are used to, to it by now? So basically, you know, they're so used to the idea that certain wildlife provides, um, you know, certain properties for illnesses, uh, traditional, that traditional um, people are, are buying, you know, cured by. Is there a way that we can curve that thought? Thank you, Megid. And well, um, we, if we understood what's really going on in the minds of those, uh, you know, peoples, I think we will have solved, um, I think, uh, you know, the majority of conservations of uh, 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 issue um, at the at the moment. Uh, so I, I think um, th this is where it becomes, uh, you know, um, uh, one of majors um, become to become to into our uh, our attention that that the the the, the uh, social and cultural study. And then, and then uh, understanding that the, the human's behaviors becomes uh, against uh, you know the components a key uh, components for um, uh, conservation organizations uh, like uh, WCS. We just begin to uh, address uh, this, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, to just to respond to, to understand uh, how uh, certain uh, behaviors, uh, including uh, believing in 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 the magical value of of, of uh, wildlife uh, parts. As, as, as it happens, you know, we just um, uh, received a, a case uh, yesterday where uh, one Sumatran tiger is being killed in in, uh, in 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 Sumatra, and then most of along with that, you know, we also recovered, uh, you know, other parts of wildlife trade, uh, you know, wildlife parts uh, such as the tooth, and then and then the claws of the bears is because you know those 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 stuff, you know, that, uh, believe uh, to add uh, some kind of uh, power uh, to to uh, the consumer of the the owners to address to respond to this kind of behaviors i think uh, you know um uh, one one thing if if it's a protected species uh, we cannot go beyond we cannot go around uh, you know endorsing or enforcing uh, law uh, enforcement but if it's for uh, non protected species because indonesian's law differentiates two categories for uh, wildlife in indonesia protected and non protected and then for those non protected we have another law that 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 uh, uh, you know, regulate the, the volume or the amounts of the consumptions. But uh, this law, of course, you know, face uh, challenges in terms of, you know, uh, lack of, of, of data. And then we do not understand the level of the sustainability, most of the, you know, uh, the sustainability harvest for most of this of the species. So, um, Quick response, uh, short response uh, to, to you, uh, to, to, you know, to, to address uh, this kind of uh, behavior uh, for protected spaces that we have still go for law enforcement and then for non-protected spaces, uh, I think uh, combinations of, of uh, educations and, 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 and campaigns, uh, I think, you know, is usually uh, the, 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 the usual way uh, to go. I agree. Thank you for that. And I, and I guess it also depends on the, the data that is available, whether those mm. species need protection or not. There's yeah. not always that availability, whether a species is under threat or, or not. So there's probably a need to, to look into how we can improve yeah. that as well. Yeah. Um, and a question for um, uh, Esther. There, there's um, a question here in regards to the uh, climate continuously changing and the world's temperatures um, getting hotter. 
So how do you think this global event, how that will contribute to the emergence and re-emergence of zoonotic disease? So this, this probably has um, really to do with those vector-borne diseases that are sort of temperature driven as well. Um, yeah, thank you, Maggie. Um, thank you for that question. Yeah, uh, vector-borne diseases because the exotherms are sensi quite sensitive to changes in temperature. Uh, but uh, so what we know is uh, with the changes in climate, um, there's uh, three ways where uh, that this can influence vector-borne diseases. First of all, it's in the distribution of the vectors. So all vectors operate within some thermal limits. So you have, um, you know, as we get hotter, some regions will become more suitable for these vectors to survive longer, long enough to transmit the disease. But also, um, then with the changes in rainfall, then you might have habitats that are more suitable, you know, creation of habitats that are suitable for these vectors to thrive. But also at the pathogen level, pathogens are also influenced by changes in temperature. So this affects the rate at which they develop. So all of these factors combined, you know, then can result in um, us potentially seeing outbreaks of these diseases in areas where now that didn't have it but now the climate has become more suitable. And with uh, humans being more connected than ever in international trade, then it's e easier to facilitate dispersal and spread of these vectors. So all you would need is uh, you know, a mosquito or uh, any other such vector traveling into an area that suddenly you know, now has suitable temperatures and under the right conditions that can then um, establish and you can start seeing disease spread. Thank you for that. And, and talking about sort of the right condition, um, conditions um, in a certain environment, um, I've got a question here from John Tazarin, um, and this one is directed to Professor McCallum um, in regards to um, if, if in a marketplace people buy mush, bush meat, um, and, and meat in the same place where slaughtering of the animals is, is taking place. Um, what is the risk of zoonotic origin disease to develop in, in those locations? Um, well, it's certainly quite high. Um, I mean, it, it depends very much on the sort of pathogen that you're dealing with. Um, I think the, the key issue is um, that when you are running a fairly well a poorly regulated wet market you have very very high densities of animals you have animals under stress you have animals in close contact with each other which under natural circumstances would never be in close contact with each other and that then obviously increases the probability that you'll get spillover occurring and also that you'll be getting these recombination events um, so um the risk is, yes, it, it is very, very high, and it's, it's fundamentally to do with the um, diversity of species, the density of the species, and the conditions under which they're kept. Okay, perfect. I hope that answered that question. Um, I've got quite a few questions rolling in, so I'm just trying to work um, through the ones that um, are both in chat and the Q&A. Please. Um, put them in the Q and A because it's easier for me to um, to look at them, and I don't have to go through a number of screens to try and and um, look at some of the questions. Um, I do read sort of generally um, there are a lot of passionate conservationists um, online, which is great to see. You know, they're all very much in favour of of banning that those wet markets and and wildlife trade and and making sure that we you know are safe from um, any of those future uh, pandemics happening. Um, so maybe we want to talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the, the banning of the trade again, just to, to ease some of those um, uh, questions and, and anxieties around that. Um, there's a question here from Idris, which is, you know, directed at um, us scientists, uh, social scientists or, or researchers in the field of, of conservation, um, as well as microbiology. Um, who mentioned that marijuana and hard drugs are banned in Indonesia, so why can't a ban on wild trade and eating uh, wildlife trade and, and eating them, such a ban on bats, which is known to be a major source of zoonotic disease, uh, but traded and eaten widely in some provinces in Indonesia, and even in Jakarta, be enforced in Indonesia and other parts of Asia. Uh, the social health and economic cost of this pandemic is enormous, great to be taken in, 
uh, high ground and not wanting to take sides. Um, however, as scientists, we have a social responsibility, especially if we choose to be sitting on the fence and not uh, be decisive and come out with clear guidelines. Um, so yeah, maybe um, uh, Dr. Andiani uh, can highlight this a little bit more I, uh, because, you know, from a WCS uh, perspective um, uh, and, and clarify that one a little bit. Uh, from my own perspective, you know, we as scientists, uh, we don't always choose to sit on the fence. You know, we're led by the results of our science and whether that directs us to one side of defense or the other side that basically leads towards that. But maybe have a bit of an insight from, um, from Dr. Andiani about that one. Um, thank you, Maggie, and thank you for the uh, questions. Uh, again, uh, this is not an um, easy question to answer, and there is uh, we are dealing with 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 non. Um, you know, this is a gray um, area. Um, one things uh, you know, uh, uh, recognizing the, the 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 right for for the community for uh, you know to continue their um, cultures on social uh, practices practices eating, uh, wildlife, and on the other hand. You you know, we are confronted with with the with the, the with the you know continue uh, the increasing uh, global uh, populations and then uh, massive uh, environmental uh, uh, degradations. Again, so finding the, the balance, uh, the, you know, to 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 um, to uh, meet uh, these two extremes um, uh, goals is is very different, uh, very dif uh, very difficult. And then it is up to me, you know, if if I run this country and then I become I'm the king of the world or the queen of, of the, the world, you know. I, I think for sure I will, I will, I will, uh, you know, stop uh, the, the bans. But I, I do understand. But this is uh, this is not uh, easy because it might uh, lead to um, others uh, things. The the legal become uh, illegal, then then the uh, the, the illegals it become becomes more um, uh, covered um, uh, activities. So um, and then I also uh, agree that 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 that. Um, um, uh, uh, regulations uh, uh, based on 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 fear um, it is not is not um, wise uh, either. So it has to go back to 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 uh, you know to the community. But we need to understand. But one thing that we found it's very interesting, you know, from our um, you know our, our monitoring in in markets in North Sulawesi, for example, that the cost for 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 wildlife meat actually uh, it, it is sometimes is higher than 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 the cost for for a domestic uh, you know meat from from chicken and even from 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 uh, pig, uh, this indicates that that, that the, the 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 drivers from from this consumption is not uh, for for uh, you know for uh, let's call it uh, for for the community is not for uh, but it, it is it's more uh, for the you know to address the, the commercial need of, of uh, this consumption. This this is something that, that that we need to address, and then somehow we need to put um, you know um, we need we need to put um, um, some 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 kind of of, um, um, have to say, uh, uh, blind, pumbatas. What is pumbatas in English? No, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, you know, uh, when, 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 Norm or when 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 uh, uh, to 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 to, uh, to stop, um, and then the other thing that I find is very interesting. I you know whoever asked that that question, I'm 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 with you uh, uh, with this. You know if we can if we can uh, again you know uh, put a clear uh, uh, law to stop uh, the, the the use of of, of uh, you know this this this. Um, 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 uh, the, the narcotics and and, and etc. And then we, 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 because we understand the, the the negative implication of this, why can we do something uh, for for uh, wildlife uh, uh, consumption? And then um, the other thing is, I, I think the, the other message that I like to to, to share uh, for this forum is, uh, you know, that that that's uh, since uh, the you know since we becomes uh, the modern humans actually is very few that that uh, very few wildlife that we um, uh, you know we have to 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 breed and then uh, the, this, the, the, the the evolution of, of the you know our relationship with wildlife I think need uh, telling us something about this that, that we, we should not actually you know uh, consume anything that we cannot we cannot uh, you know put it into uh, you know captive breed uh, program or something that we can rear in our backyard if thank you yeah Thank you uh, there with, with those comments on that one. And, and I guess our, our main goal is what we all uh, want is just eradicating, you know, having the possibility of these pandemics to happen again. And, 
and, and looking at, at ways to do that, whether that's through wildlife trade or, or any other way um, to do so. So we're, we're trying to look at maybe some success stories as well. And, um, and, and maybe if there has been, you know, when we're looking at other pandemics that happened uh, previously, there have, been, there have been successes achieved in that field. Um, Dr. Anyango, is there any success story in eradicating or reducing vector-borne zoonotic diseases um, at all? And, and how does climate change affect the spread of those um, for not non-tropic areas as well? So higher or lower altitudes, not just the, the areas with higher temperature. Um, are there any success stories in um, eradicating vector borne diseases? Um, yes. Yellow, yellow fever is one. Um, yellow fever is also cited as well, the first time that the link was made between mosquitoes transmitting disease and um, uh, from, from animals uh, to humans through, you know. But um, the, with a increased vaccination that is largely controlled and was largely eradicated, we're just now starting to see uh, brief outbreaks again. And uh, so there's a need to rebalance that strategy and um, redo that. So what's happening is for a lot of these diseases, there's also extensive eradication of malaria that was done for the Northern hemisphere. But um, again, this goes back to the strategies that were used at that time have been found not to be quite environmentally effective. So uh, we now again have incidences of uh, 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 diseases that had been largely controlled, such as uh, malaria or dengue spreading into areas that um, didn't have them before. And this um, can be linked to strategies, but also to uh, changes in climate as well. So as the climate changes, then we have to reevaluate how we um, manage these diseases as well. And I, I think the second part of that was um, asking about how climate influences the spread. Sorry. Yeah, more about um, how the temperature in, in sort of non-tropical areas, if, whether that has seen an increase in those vector-borne diseases as well. Um, in some areas, yes. So um, most of these vectors are, are limited by um, threshold temperature. Um, so for example, with, um, something like malaria would be 16 degrees. And when you have a global warming happening, there are areas that may have the mosquito present, but they just haven't been able to complete the disease transmission cycle because the temperatures are too low. So if you have higher temperatures, then that just means that potentially you can have your pathogen will complete its development within the mosquito fast enough to transmit to human beings. So as we see, um, we have projections showing that the distribution range of these uh, vector-borne diseases are going to expand with uh, increasing temperatures. Again, these are projections. And um, the thing with uh, climate change, you know, it's, there's a whole range of other factors also influencing vector-borne diseases. And it's quite hard to attribute you know, changes specifically to just climate change impacts alone. So by understanding these projections of risk and then also then lead into management practices where we can uh, reduce um, uh, the severity of any potential outbreaks, uh, risk reduction of uh, any projected future outbreaks as well. Thank you. Thank you for that um, for that answer. That's great. Um, I just wondered, obviously there's, been a lot of resources put towards, you know, eradicating vector-borne diseases, you know, especially malaria and, and, and dengue one of, and, and Zika virus as well, we, most recently, um, in, in regards to eradicating um, that risk. Now, there's a lot of money that has been put towards, you know, thinking about vaccines and, and, and ways to um, you know, curve that, that pandemic as well. So, that, because obviously, we, you know, we feel, you know, human life is very valuable, but when we when you flip that coin and look at the value of economic valuation of wildlife itself, would that have any effect in, in sort of um, uh, finding methods to, that could be used to, to um, you know, protect or, uh, conservation or, or curve that, that wildlife trade as well? And this one, I, I think um, Professor McCallum would be good to answer that one as well. Um. That's, I think, a very interesting question. Um, the, the notion that 
simply by making something economically valuable, it will automatically lead to its conservation, I think is is fairly flawed. I mean, one only has to look at the example of rhino horn. It's got an enormous amount of value and uh, that doesn't lead to conservation. So the the notion that if something is valuable, it will therefore be conserved, I think is naive and often completely untrue. Um, really, I think what is important is to recognise that um, there are things, if, if we, we, we can give value to um, good conservation practices, I mean, certainly in the case of um, Hendra virus, one of the things that we're increasingly understanding is that um, we get spillover events because destruction of the natural habitat drives the bats to live into closer association with humans. So um, if one looks at examples like that and uh, similar things, I think, are uh, probably the case for Nipah virus, which um, is an issue in um, in Malaysia and Bangladesh and um, almost certainly Indonesia as well. It's another virus that, uh, that comes out of flying foxes. And so I think promoting strategies that conserve natural environments and therefore stop the, um, the, the wildlife being forced to live into close, in, in close association with humans, those sorts of strategies, I think, are ones that are sort of win-win on both sides. So um, I think we need to be looking at those sorts of solutions. Okay, and, and so when looking at that, um, you know, obviously, what, and, and you've been working in, in that field for quite a long time in regards to that wildlife trade as well. Um, why is it such a globally unsolvable issue? Why is it, uh, the question here is, what is the key reason? Is it sol solely related to awareness, or behaviour change, or or what, what would be the main cause that it, it's becoming such an unsolvable um, type of uh, issue? Um, well, I mean, I think if we, if we knew the answer to that, we would solve it. Um, so that's hardly an answer, but I, I, I think it's, it's, it's the reality. I mean, there are things that one can do in specific cases, uh, such as the one I just talked about. Um, clearly, um, education is very, very important. And, um, you know, if one is looking at... Um, something like um, Ebola in, in Africa, then um, Ebola is a threat to the great apes, but also uh, consumption of the great apes will ex may expose people to the, to the pathogen. So um, often it's education, um, but when one is up against um, people who have got a strong commercial interest in um, continuing the wildlife trade, um, where there are strong historical reasons why people have always done this. I mean, I, I think the other thing that um, we probably need to face up to is that practices that were perfectly sustainable in the past are now in many cases no longer sustainable due to the fact that we've got increasing human populations and decreasing wildlife populations. So um, I think we need to recognise that that's the case and um, again, it's a matter of education. It's saying to people, yes, this might have been something that has traditionally been done um, and it might have in the past been perfectly sustainable, but it no longer is. And this is why. Thank you. And, and, and yeah, and myself being in the field of community engagement and education, it's, it's um, you know, at times a very difficult uh, platform because it's also finding the interest from you know, the, the governmental bodies to implement those educational and awareness programs. So they all, always are usually underfunded. Um, and, you know, recently have found that some of the educational awareness programs to do with protecting environments have been cut even, even in Australia. So it's that, that part is, is quite a, a hard one and, and that's very important. Yeah, um, just one comment I'd make on that is um, part of our, uh, our, our Hendra virus stuff is, is looking at the human issues and, I think it's really important that to get across to people, you need to have narratives, you need to have stories. And I think training people or people, those of us who are in the sciences need to engage with people from the social sciences and humanities to be able to produce the stories that communicate to people. I think just hectoring them and throwing large amounts of evidence at them alone doesn't work. It's got to be framed in an appropriate way and there have to be stories which people will tell to each other which communicate these things. Yeah, definitely. And I think it, it comes down to good science communication as well, which is, uh, which is a really important field that we see from universities 
um, going from, you know, from a research and what we find out to communicate that effectively to, um, to the community. We do have a session on communities. Um, as our, that's our last webinar. So if you are interested in, in that particular topic, um, please join us then. That's, I think, the last, uh, Leah might remind me on, on, um, on the date on that one, but that's uh, specifically towards um, the community engagement um, perspective. Um, Dr. Andiani, are you able to maybe provide a little bit of uh, thought about you know, eradicating uh, that, that issue of, of wildlife trade? Why, is, why it is such an unsolvable uh, type of uh, issue within Indonesia itself? Is it so embedded within the culture that we, we can't um, curve that or is, or is it something that, that we could do here? Thank you, Maggie. Um, I think I, I, I like what uh, Professor McCallum uh, um, has mentioned uh, earlier, that, that, that um, one education and then I think the, uh, uh, you know, the ability to create a story, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, to, um, to, to be communicated why is, uh, such practices um, is not, is not, uh, should not be considered as socially and culturally acceptable at the moment is because this practice is no longer uh, done at the sustainable rate given, you know, the big, the, the, the high um, uh, population, human populations um, uh, we have now. And 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 then why is such a becomes, uh, you know, a very difficult issue um, uh, to, to tackle is because I think the economics, the economics benefits, uh, you know, to, to, to such things is um, uh, or, uh, overcomes the, the, the um, either the, the, the legal or social implications of, of uh, doing so. Um, if you can uh, sell, um, you know, a, a, a grams of, of a rhino horns powder for uh, three thousand dollars per per grams, and and then you know, compared to to uh, the the uh, the how to say the, the, the numbers of fines being needed to pay or the 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 length of uh, you know prison time you need to to, to spend is 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 is. Um, Almost, you know, is 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 nothing. We have in uh, our experiences um, um, uh, dealing with with um, many uh, hunters and then wildlife traders that have been gone and out prisoners uh, prisons uh, several times, you know, and 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 uh, because uh, one thing for sure is because the, the economic profit they gain from from this business is is really is really 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 tremendous. You know, this this is you know. A, a, compensate whatever uh, legal or social implication they, they, they might have and and then uh, on, on the other side of, of this of, of this uh, you know system is is the market for for you know to address the the, the market needs um, I guess yes we have to go back to to um, educations and then and then you know um, and I think also applying uh, applying uh, the, the same levels of um, uh, severity of law uh, enforcement. So, so law itself, the the, the, the strict uh, you know um, uh, application of law doesn't only apply for for the for the traders, but also to to, to the buyers um, as well. I'm talking. I'm addressing specific uh, specifically, uh, you know, for uh, for uh, protected uh, spaces. But uh, for non-protected spaces, uh, you know, we do have uh, uh, different levels of of um, you know uh, regulations that. Um, uh, you know, aim to address this, but um, uh, those the, the application or uh, enforcement of the law uh, of those regulation, of, of course, you know, always uh, bar with, with, with lack of, of, of data in our understandings about, you know, the, the consumptions, uh, the level of consumption at one side and then also the, the levels, uh, uh, the population health at the other, the, uh, you know, uh, on the other side. Okay, thank you. Well, I think um, I think we've got time for one more question, and I think this question is for um, everyone in the panel. So maybe give your thoughts about that particular question, and and we'll start with um, uh, Dr. Onyango. And and the question would be like now we've obviously going through a pandemic, and and in people are more of understanding about these wet markets, wildlife trade, and the connection between you know the natural uh, the pressure on a natural environment and connection to um, sort of human health. What, what do you think, what is the world going to look like after, you know, or when we're dealing with this sort of when the pandemic is mainly, you know, had its past a second wave and we're in that recovery stage? What, what do you expect to see as a, as a global community 
Um, do you expect to see some kind of a change in, in terms of how we're looking at conservation or wildlife trade or, or uh, what, what, are you, what are your views on that? I think generally, uh, as a global community, yes, I expect to see some change, but just uh, just uh, uh, really, first of all, in the level of awareness and understanding how these diseases do emerge and how some of these connections, um, um, you know, how we're utilizing our land, the wildlife trade, and uh, the, our behaviors and the connections between that and disease. Uh, there's a more heightened awareness of that. There's also, you know, been a lot of... Um, uh, information put out there and um, to help people understand these uh, information sessions like these webinars. So I would expect that when we come out of this, it's just um, knowing those links and understanding those links and um, thinking forward to the future on how we can uh, uh, modify our behaviors better to, to prevent uh, such pillover events. But of course, that's just one aspect of it, but also understanding how other bigger drivers such as climate change and economic development and deforestation and how those contribute to um, disease emergence and how we can balance our need for, for you know, uh, bigger societies, urbanization, faster travel, how we balance that need and also uh, protect the environment and also, you know, prevent more of these pandemics happening. I don't have an exact answer, but that is, you know, something that also needs to be looked at at the policy level. In the climate change space, there's um, the growing notion of climate resilient development pathways, which understands that we cannot sacrifice the health of the environment um, at the expense of economic development. So it's finding a balance between that and choosing policy options or adaptation options that conserve the environment. And you know, part of that will also be wildlife conservation while at the same time advancing societies as well. Thank you. And, and Professor McCallum, what is, um, have you noticed any, any change? In how, how do you think the world, the global community uh, will, will look like um, sort of shortly after this pandemic? I'm hopeful. I mean, I, this, this has been, a once in a century shock to the world system. And um, I think it is a real opportunity for those of us who are working in the conservation area to really bring home the message that um, interference with natural systems, disrupting natural systems, leads to consequences which are not um, just of importance to those of us who care about conservation, but are fundamentally important to the people who claim to be very hard-headed and care only about the economy. If one looks at the, the damage that this is doing um, in terms of lives, but in terms of economic damage and in terms of societal disruption, it's enormous. And I think this is a moment that we all need to seize to try to cause a, a bit of a reset in the way that the world regards um, rampant environmental destruction. The, I think various people are pushing this message, but we need to be very strong in it, that this is a warning sign. And um, as various people have said, and I think Esther was sort of alluding to a little bit, um, if we think this is bad, we need to see what the consequences of climate change will be. Um, it's a longer process and it's a slower process, but ultimately it will be more serious. Thank you. So overall, fairly positive, so that we can, you know, maybe uh, use that vehicle for for more change. So that's why I think it's a teachable moment. Yeah, perfect. And um, Dr. Andayani, what are your thoughts about the future? Well, thank you, Maggie. I I, I wish I could be as optimistic as um, my uh, uh, college speakers, uh, my, my my panelists in this in, in this webinars. Um, I, I well personally, I do I do hope that we are um, uh, uh, going out a better person from 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 this uh, pandemic and then better uh, as a community as well. Um, but our um, 
preliminary observations about the markets and then also the 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 the, the keeping wildlife or consuming wildlife's behaviors uh, uh, across uh, several markets here in Indonesia unfortunately do not uh, show any significant uh, change we did see we do see uh, you know some uh, decrease of activities on those markets but when we um, you know um, did uh, this uh, uh, quick survey about, about this the risk Response, unfortunately, not very um, you know promising and encouraging. The reasons they uh, you know they don't come to the market, don't visit the market, is more uh, because they are afraid of this human to human um, you know uh, uh, transmission or infection. They don't make the connections between what we are having right now uh, you know to to um, uh, to uh, wildlife um, uh, or the, the, the origins from 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 uh, wildlife. The other observation we just uh, you know, uh, found out just recently that the numbers of uh, you know people who buy birds in uh, several cities in Java increasing double fold since uh, the governments apply uh, this uh, limited um, movement or working from home uh, policies is because um, you know we 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 need to explore this this uh, findings more. But one of the uh, you know one of the reason that we could think uh, at this moment is because you know people got. got Maybe they get bored by by sticking home and then nothing to do, and then then one 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 way you know uh, the activity that they, they, they look at is you know, by by you know uh, keeping um, the bird or visiting the the um, wildlife uh, market. So. I guess we, we, we need we, there we still have a long way uh, to go you know to 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 educate uh, people on on this subject Maggie and, and unfortunately and and then uh, if you are in, in Indonesia I think uh, our infection rate is still very high the highest now among Southeast Asia but if you look around so that, that people I think uh, becomes a pay less attention about 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 uh, this issue let alone you know uh, confronting them with with the challenge of of, of you know uh, global pandemics or or um, uh, climate change, um, but I, I I would like to to be along with my uh, other panelists, you know, to, to close my 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 statement with much more uh, positive uh, notes, um, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, this note to me is just uh, there there is um, you know a, a long way for us to go, and then um, but but this pandemic give us the opportunity the people from conservations uh, you know a, a group to talk to other uh, groups uh, you know that usually we are not in the talking uh, term you know for example uh, for the ministers of health ministry of education or including ministers of uh, finance for the, uh, you know for that matters thank you wonderful so thank you so we yeah so there has been any there has been change and you're expecting change but we need we need to press for maybe a little bit more and, and use that vehicle right now, that moment, uh, right now, in order to push for that maybe a little bit more. So we want to give a big thank you for our panel, uh, Professor McCallum, Dr. Onyango, and, uh, and Dr. Andayani. Thank you so much for your time and expertise in providing some of those insights, and especially uh, you know, based on your experience and your, and your work. Um, I'm sorry for all the participants that we haven't gotten to all the, the questions that are uh, asked, but terima kasih banyak untuk semua for putting uh, the efforts into attending for the entire session and um, and uh, raising some questions that um, hopefully has uh, provided some insights for you as well. Um, thank you for attending. Um, we're going to close the the session soon. Uh, if you are interested, we are uh, running another session next week and the week after. So hopefully you'll be present for that. All very interesting topics um, in relation to the pandemic, and hopefully you can join us then. So thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie, and then all the panelists, uh, and also the participants who stay until the end of the webinar. Um, so a lot of you ask questions, the participants, about the materials. You can download it in our Google Drive account. Uh, Handika uh, here from Catch DCC will share the information about that. And then also for those of you who uh, request for certificates, you can also send um, a, a request by filling in the form in the link, uh, but we do have a deadline, so uh, you can fill in that link now. Um, so again, thank you very much for all who is joining. Next week on Thursday, uh, 
uh, at around 10.30 uh, a.m. Jakarta time, we will confirm with you again. Later, there will be another webinar with a focus on ecotourism, uh, ecotourism for uh, economic recovery uh, from the pandemic. So stay tuned from um, you know our email we will send you regular updates about it and then uh, our team will um, in touch with you in sending all the uh, blog posts and then also uh, information for the next webinars and then the links to the YouTube and the material. So thank you very much for joining um, and you don't have to fill in any uh, attendance list because Zoom will give us a attendance report so we uh, can uh, get information of um, which people who are attending joining since the beginning until the end. So again, thank you very much. And then I would like to, uh, for the speakers and moderators and Payatna to turn on the video. We will have a picture. <laughs> it's important. Ah, that's so, important. Yeah. <laughs> that is important. We will have a, a picture together. Uh, I think we lost Maggie already. Oh, Maggie's still here? Good. All right, so Hendika, uh, maybe you could um, pause a little bit uh, for, for a while for the sharing of the screen and then we can take picture. So yeah, even though online, you know, we still need pictures. <laughs> but yet now we couldn't see you. And Hendika as well. But Hendika, uh, pa Yatna. All right, great. Okay, everyone, one, two, three, smile. Yeah. Cheers. I Thank hope you. Everybody Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. And then for all, um, you know, thank you very much for all the passion. Thank you. And, and then see you next week on Catch GCC webinar. I'm Leah Zakia with the team all of here. I uh, hope it, uh, it is all useful. Selamat sore. Uh, good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, Hendika, you can share the screen again for the participants who uh, want to get the information about the certificates. And then for the distinguished panelists, thank you very much. You can leave the, um, the meeting right now and then we'll follow up with you um, um, about the unanswered questions. <laughs> we have 27 of them. So perhaps you could help us uh, in answering those questions again. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, we will wait.